Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I want to move into the last section of the book of Galatians as far as this threefold division. We have seen that because of these false teachers, the Judaizers who came to the churches of Galatia, that in chapters 1 and 2, Paul defends his apostleship by going over the experiences in his life. Then in chapters 3 and 4, we laid out something of the major elements of the gospel. Now in chapter 5, in the first part of of chapter 6, Paul comes back to answer what was the one of the most devastating questions and um, uh, probably concerns that the Judaizers had. And their concern was, how can free grace issue in sacrificial living? Now, I would like for you to kind of note the outline tonight that I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to be dealing with verses 1 through 15. In verses 1 through 12 of the fifth chapter, we're dealing with the perversion of legalism as it relates to freedom. In verses 13 and 15, we're dealing with the perversion of antinomianism, or there are no rules, or uh, using freedom as a license to sin. Now, there are two ditches in this area of freedom. Uh, As you see from the next uh, third note down, This whole concept of how should Christians live is a concern to Paul as it was with the Judaizers. They would say, if you just take immoral pagans, you take them right off the street, and you offer them eternal salvation in Jesus Christ, they're still going to be immoral pagans. No, you've got to give them some guidelines to follow. Uh, You've got to prop them up with some rules. You've got to show them what's inappropriate. Paul's answer to that is quite revealing. If there's anybody who knew the struggles and potential of self-effort within the law of Moses, it was the Apostle Paul. And he came to the dead end of saying all that he had done in Judaism, he counted as rubbish, it's a stronger word than that, for Christ. No, Paul says, I've come to the conclusion that the best way to make a man Christ-like is to give him a new heart, not give him a new set of rules. We gave him a set of rules in the Old Testament and nobody could keep them. So the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 is, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to write my word on your heart, not on tablets of stone, and you will serve me because of who you are not what you can become. And so Paul is going to argue that the best way for uh, Christians to live godly lives is free grace. And that once a person understands what God has done in saving them while they were yet sinners, once a person understands the price that God paid to bring them to himself, that that person is going to have a life of overflowing gratitude to a God who loved and received him like that. And there is no better, stronger, or sure impetus toward Christ's likeness than understanding who we are in free grace. Now, there has, this theme of grace has been continuing throughout this book. Some have called this the book of the radical free grace of God. I think that in many ways that is the true theme. I think the theme of this book is expressed in chapter 5, verse 6, and I will get to that in just a moment. This theme of freedom is going to be expressed in verse 1 and again in verse 13. It introduces these two different aspects of of the abuses of freedom. There are many uh, Greek manuscripts that take the first part of chapter 5 and put it with the last part of chapter 4. Because some say that this word free is a play on the last verse, verse 31 of chapter 4. We're talking about the free woman, we're talking about freedom, and we're talking about being freed. A three-fold play on the word freedom, free woman, and freed. And some say that should go together. 
And at, at the middle of verse 1 of chapter 5 is where this new section starts. Uh, I'm not real sure about that because I think that the truth is he is going to discuss freedom as it impacts the Christian life. This is a subject that we need to talk about. It's a subject we're probably not going to agree on. But I hope you will follow in your Bibles with me. I hope you will look at your notes. I hope you will analyze what I have to say. I hope you will pray about it, and I hope you'll walk in the light that you have. Let's look at this together, if we might. This is freedom, he starts out. Now, the thing that I think is, is so uh, pervasive among even believers is, is this false view of freedom that says, I am free, now I can do what I want to do. Now I can live my own life. Life free from all these entanglements of the, the evil one or a fallen nature. That's just not the way it works, friends. We serve one of two masters in this world, and neither one of them is ourselves. We either serve God or we serve Satan. What God has done in his mercy is pull the power plug of the old sin nature, Romans 6. And by pulling the power plug of the old sin nature... He has allowed us to be free from sin in order that we now might be free to serve God. We're never free to serve self. I think we need to hear that over and over and over and over again. If you want to see it in Romans 6, it's Romans six eleven. We died. The old covenant was negated. Now we're alive to serve Christ. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Serve God in your bodies. American individualism and American freedom has tended for us to say, well, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to choose my own destiny. I'm going to work my own deal. If you're a Christian, you have no deal but God's deal. When you came to Christ, you laid down your rights and you took up His yoke. You're only free now to serve Him. You're not free to do what you want to do. It's a major truth. I'm not sure we can receive it. You'll never find happiness and joy until you do. The second part is that Christ has made us free. I love to preach on the, the freedom of the Christian. I believe in the freedom of the Christian. Martin Luther, I think, has said this as, as, as well as I have ever seen it expressed by a human being. I want to express it in his words. He said that the Christian man is a free lord of all and subject to none. And the next sentence he said, the Christian man is a dutiful servant to all, subject to all. Now, that may seem a terrible paradox to you, but that's exactly where we are as Christians. We are really, 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 really free in Christ. Baptists have put so many rules on us that are unbiblical. We are so free in Christ. And yet, because of the fact we have a new heart, and the fact that we've been changed, and the fact that we've been brought out of darkness into light, we choose not to offend even the weakest of these who are going to go with us to Jesus. So we lay down our freedom ourselves. No, you can't do it corporately. You can't even do it in a family. You've got to do it individually. We lay down our freedom for the cause and glory of Christ. And so we become people who have limited our real freedom that others may come to know Christ and that other Christians may not stumble over our freedom. The classical passage is Romans 14. Another very important passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and the ending of verse 10. I mean, excuse me, chapter 10, verse 23 and following. Talk about how does a Christian struggle with freedom. You know, teaching in a, uh, uh, pastoring in a college town and, and teaching with college students through the years it has been absolutely amazing to me that the students, that Christian students that come from conservative homes, many times when they get away, from the restraints of mother and dad. Go absolutely crazy on freedom. Freedom is a heady drug that must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We are free in Christ. And then he says to them, 
Because you're free, because you've been called to freedom, he says two things to them. Keep on standing in it and stop letting your necks be fastened in the yoke of slavery again. It is, it is so hard for me to explain this uh, to a Baptist audience. Of course, I'm Baptist myself. We have become so focused on the need to make an initial decision, which I agree with with every fiber of my evangelistic heart. But that's not the whole story. Coming to Christ is not making a decision somewhere back there. Coming to Christ is the establishment of a relationship that must persevere to give evidence of the validity of the relationship. The perseverance is what tells you a relationship is started. God deliver me from Christians who live just like the world and say, but I trusted Christ somewhere back there. There's something sick about that. So the first thing we must do is stand in this freedom. Stand in who we are in Christ. Hang on. Persevere. Keep on trucking. Don't grow weary in well-doing. To him who overcomes, I'll give the crown of life. I'm not talking about Christians who sin. We all sin. I'm not crossing, talking about Christians who struggle with this or that in their life. We all struggle with this or that. I'm talking about perseverance. Standing in who we are in Christ. And the second thing is not turning back again to this yoke of slavery. There are many yokes of slavery in the religious world. I think religion, to tell you the truth, is a barrier to God. Because religion is man's attempt to come to God. And man can't come to God. And as long as man thinks he can come to God, he's in danger of losing God forever. It's when we know that only God can come to us. This yoke is a very significant thing. It was used by the rabbis to describe the law of Moses. And really, even more than that, their oral traditions and interpretations about the law of Moses. Now, Jesus also used this when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean on me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. There's a yoke that Jesus has. I mean, there's guidelines... We're not saying for a Christian there are no guidelines. We're not saying for a Christian there are no rules. We're not saying for a Christian there's no appropriate action. We've never been saying that. There is a yoke. But Jesus says, my yoke is light. It's easy. It fits you well. It won't chafe you. You'll be able to to function within what I want you to function in. So we're to stay not in the guidelines of legalistic systems, We're to stay in the guidelines of the mind of Christ. The law of Christ is expressed in many ways. In verse 2, Paul comes and says, Here is what I'm trying to say to you. Literally, this is, Behold, I, Paul... Now, this is strong. This, this This is a real emphasis in Greek. This is almost Paul's apostolic authority coming through. I, Paul... He's, he's going he's to make a strong statement to them. Now, that is a strong statement. Listen to this. If you let yourself... This is a third class conditional sentence, which means potential, even probable action. We've seen from other places in Galatians where the present tense is used to describe their turning from Christ to turning to the legalism of the Judaizers that they were not yet circumcised, but they were leaning that way. They had not yet left Christ to go to the the yoke of Judaism, but they were turning that way. He comes back to that statement again. If you let yourselves, it's passive. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ can do you no good. Oh my goodness, what are we talking about here? The thing that I think has confused people in Galatians is, and it's so difficult to know how to balance these things. On one hand, we believe that the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. We believe the only inspired uh, uh, literature is the Bible. And so, if we can, we try to find in obscure passages or difficult passages a clear expression of the will of God somewhere else. Or if in a, it, we, even within an author, if we can find a more definitive passage on a subject, we try to go to that, that passage. 
But the danger of always using this systematic theology, this systematic understanding what the Bible says as a whole, the danger in that is we never let certain verses speak because certain verses sometimes seem to say things we aren't comfortable with. And the first thing we must do as good readers of the Bible is listen to what the Bible says, not demand what it says to fit our understanding of the whole. Galatians is a scary book to me. It's become more scary. These people are going to be called the elect of God, the called, the one who called you. That's, that's a way of referring to election. They're, they're elect. Now listen to me, please follow with me before you reject this. They're elect. They're the churches of Galatia. The Spirit has manifested Himself there as evidence. And Paul says to this group of elect, saved Galatians, if you turn back to Judaism, you have left Christ. God Help me, what do I do with the security of the believer in the face of text like 411, uh, 3, 4, and 5, 2 through 4? First of all, I would say, please, I hope you hear me. Please try to hear me before you cut me off. I don't think the Bible ever deals with the subject of the security of the believer as a main topic in any text. That's not a question they were asking. It's only a question today because of some denominational confusion in other areas, I think. Because some groups of Christians believe that you can be lost and saved and lost and saved and lost and saved, depending on how you live. I reject that with every ounce of theological fiber in me. And if you ever read Hebrews 6, whatever it does, it does mean, it does say this, once out, always out. It does teach that. You can't go back if you believe it. What this is saying, that there are two ways that you trust in making heaven. One way is the way of human effort. It's the way of, look what I've done, look what I do. It's performance religion. And the other way is the free, no strings attached, death of Jesus on our behalf. Now, there's only two ways. You can't start in one and go to the other. They, they can't be mixed. They're absolutely capsuled. Now, what frightens me is, it looks like these, who are believers, are being warned of consequences of a future choice. What has always bothered me is the uh, gung-ho evangelist type who as a young person was so committed to Christ and so serving him and something has happened be it a philosophy class or a, a, a temptation to sin or just whatever happened and now you talk to them and they say I don't know what I was doing back there I, re I, I just reject everything I believed I, I'm, I don't believe in Christ I don't know all the ins and outs of this but I want to tell you this if someone comes to place that they say, I don't, I don't trust Christ. The doctrine of assurance of salvation won't hold them. Because salvation is not something in the past unrelated to our existential present. And what Christians do is they trust and continue to trust. They repent and continue to repent. You say, I don't like that. Quote, I don't like it either. Did you read this text? I didn't write this text. Paul wrote this text. The one who we go to for these passages on assurance wrote this text. I can't remove this text because it doesn't fit my theology. What's more important, my theology or the writings of Paul? Oh, this terrifies me. God help me, Paul. What are we talking about? We're talking about two ways of being saved. And if you turn away from Christ into self-effort, you cut yourself off from Christ. Now, verse 4 is going to say you've fallen from grace. Do not interpret that in this, this modern denominational hair pull about falling from grace. That's not talking about that. It's these two ways of salvation again. 
It's either Christ plus nothing or human effort all the way. Let me continue then. Christ can do you no good. I again insist oh, that if any man lets himself be circumcised, he is under obligation to obey the whole law. Now, back in chapter 3, verse 10, Paul quoted Deuteronomy 27, 26. It's not an exact quote. It's a quote from the Septuagint. It's a quote that adds the word all, but I, I, I think in context the word all is assumed. And basically what it's saying is, if you are going to go the way of performance Christianity, performance religion, whatever, performance Judaism, you've got to do everything all the time. And if you break it once, one time, that way is forever closed. Now, there are some passages that I think speak to that. And maybe the, maybe the clearest one is James chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. And that's exactly what Paul has said back in chapter 3, verse 10. That if you're going to go with Judaism, and I'm sure they didn't tell the people this, You've got to keep all the law all the time. If you want to be right with God through human effort, fine. Give it a shot. Nobody's ever done it except Jesus, but you give it a shot. But if you break it once, from the time you're responsible, 13 or so, until you die, in any area, that way is closed. Because if you go by performance, you're going to stand before the God of justice. Now, do any, does anybody you know want the God of justice? Now, the other way is not the God of justice. It's the God of mercy. And the justice fell on Jesus. He's the only one that can handle justice. Verse 3. He is under obligation to keep the whole law. Verse 4. You people, whoever you are. Now, there's been some fight about who that is. Uh, some would say it's the Judaizers. Some would say it's the Galatian converts to Judaism or the Judaizer perspective, which is basically Christ, yes, plus the Mosaic law. You people, whoever you are, who try to get into right standing with God, obtain righteousness through the law, listen to this now, have cut yourself off from Christ. You have missed the way of God's grace. The word cut off here is a word used over 20, I think it's used 25 times by Paul. It's used so often in Romans 6 and 7 about to make null and void, to become, to, to become absolutely nothing. Do you mean that if, I, that if I start in grace and then try to perfect myself in works, that's what chapter 3 was all about. You can't mix these two ways. In chapter 4, he's saying, if you, if you let yourself be circumcised, if you go back in the observance of days and weeks and this Judaism thing, friend, you are not in a grace relationship with God anymore. You've cut yourself off. Now, I do believe that no one can cut us off from Christ. I love the end of Romans chapter 8. Heights, or depths, principalities, or powers, things to come, all that. Nothing can separate us from love of Christ. Except ourselves. I believe the relationship with Christ is a covenant relationship, a conditional covenant based on if you will, I will. And faith and repentance is the, is the atmosphere in which we live and move and have our being in Christ. So he continues then. Verse 5. For we by the Spirit, he's making a real distinction here from those who are trying to be perfected by law. So the key to Christianity is not human effort, it's the Holy Spirit. Are waiting for the hope for our blessing, which our right standing, our righteousness, will God will bring. How do you recognize Christians? They're longing and hoping for the coming of God in Christ. They have this, uh, the word hope quite often in the New Testament means a reference to the second coming. You, you, you talk about the second coming among Christians, they almost get afraid. A real evidence that you know you're His is when you talk about the Holy Spirit uh, and the second coming and you're excited about it. Now, I realize young people want to have a life. I have no doubt about that. I understand that. But one way that characterizes true believers is this hope of the second coming of Christ. This hope of righteousness in Him that's going to be consummated in that day. 
Um, this consummation, I think, is something we don't think about a lot. I, I hope you'll look at your notes on page 45, is where I think it is, under this awaiting the hope for a blessing of which our right standing with God will bring us. Uh, I'm amazed how often salvation is depicted in all of the Greek verb tenses. This is something that we don't talk about. It, it, it's, not, it's, it, it's upsetting to us, and yet it's true. It's just as true as it can be. The Bible can say we're saved and make it a, a, an aorist tense, which is completed action in past time. It's, it's a finished act, completed thing. It can speak about us being saved in perfect tense, which means we have been saved. That's what Ephesians 2, 5 and, and 9 is all about. The Bible can also say we're being saved, meaning salvation is a process to which we go through. And quite often the Bible says we shall be saved. It makes it future. We're not fully going to be redeemed until 1 John 3, 2 comes into being. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we see him, we'll be like him. Salvation is not complete or consummated until we meet the Lord in the air and are changed into his likeness. And uh, I've given you numerous passages here on this future focus of our salvation. The Bible sees it as a process that, that moves through time. Now, uh, notice, if you will, in verse 6. For I think verse 6 is probably the key verse uh, to this whole section. And I may need to just stop here for the night. I, I need to take as long as I need to and not worry about getting through. So I'm just going to stop six here, and I'll do the rest uh, uh, next Sunday. This is the key verse, I think, of the whole book. For in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor lack of it counts for anything, but only faith that is spurred on to action by love. Now, this theme of the entire book, we've talked about circumcision, and I think, uh, I think there's a lot of hassle about this. Let me just stop for a moment and, 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 and put this in a wider perspective. There are places in Paul where Paul says, it's not circumcision or lack of circumcision that's the key. It, it's your relationship with Christ. Uh, Romans 2, I think, that's, I think that's 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 or 18 and 19, right in there. The other one is Romans 2, 28 and 29. That real circumcision is not of the body, but of the heart. Now, Paul didn't care about circumcision, really. When it came to somebody like Timothy in Acts 16.3, he circumcises Timothy so that Timothy can minister the gospel to Jews. Not because Timothy needed it to be saved, but because Timothy's mother was a Jew. And in Jewish understanding, if your mother's a Jew, you're a Jew. If your father is and your mother's a Greek, you're a Greek. So he circumcised Timothy so Timothy could work with churches that are Jewish and Jewish people. But then in, the, in, the, in Galatians chapter 2, I think it's about verse 24 through 27, something like that, he absolutely refused to circumcise Titus. Remember the Jerusalem Council thing? Because Titus was a full Greek. And it, it, then it became a point of what is the gospel. Now it wasn't just circumcised Timmy so we can help you with the Jews. Now it became what is the essence of how is a man right with God. Now it became the, a point of the gospel. Whenever it became a point of the gospel, Paul was willing to stand up against it. Whenever it was something about, uh, he said, it doesn't make any difference. If, if you're circumcised, don't try to change it. They had an operation that could change. It, it, it made it look like you never were circumcised. Don't do that, he says. Don't worry about it. That's not important. Don't worry about that. Uh, Jews, now that you believe, don't worry about that. But these Judaizers was, were using circumcision as a way to say, Jesus, yes, that's good. You've started well. But now to really be the children of Abraham, to really be the children of promise, to really be a full-fledged citizen of the kingdom of God, you got to do this and 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 this. And I'm sure they started out easy with the feast days because circumcision will kind of scare you. <laughs> I'm sure they started out with keep these feast days, you know. But they progressed to this point. And this was the initiating rite. This, along with baptizing yourself and offering a sacrifice, was the way a proselyte, a god fear, became a proselyte in Judaism. Paul. Uh, is absolutely the point. He's trying to say, circumcision is not the key unless you see it as an absolute irreducible minimum of making heaven. 
Now, if you see it that way, we've got to fight. If you see it as something that's happened to you in the past, you didn't realize, or, you know, it's not that big a deal. Neither circumcision nor lack of it counts for anything, but only faith spurred on by action. Now, most Roman Catholics here take this last verb as being passive. And this would mean that love is what brings faith. Now, I'm all for love. I think love in 1 Corinthians 13 is the, in this triad of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. I understand what they're trying to say. That love is the expression of God that called us. Love is the expression that proves to us we're of God. It's the one thing Satan can't counterfeit. But this, this word only appears in the middle voice in the New Testament. I don't think I have it in your notes. Let me just give you the places this thing occurs in the middle voice. Romans 7, 5. 2 Corinthians 1, 6. Ephesians 3, 20. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. Every one of those are Pauline. Why would one time Paul use this word differently when the way he normally uses it fits in this context? It's not that love produces faith. Faith produces love. And when we come to know Christ through the grace of God by faith, the thing that really marks us, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Faith is that undeniable mark of God's Spirit working in us that Satan cannot counterfeit. So, I do not believe that love produces faith. I believe grace produces faith, and faith produces love. And love is the sign, but not the mechanism. I was over in Shreveport witnessing this on my, uh, my uh, class one time in evangelism, and I had, a, I had a school teacher tell me, I asked her this diagnostic question of why, if you were standing before God and he were to ask you why, should I let you in my heaven, what would you say? You know what she told me? She said, I love children. Well, great. But you'll go to hell if that's all you know. Love doesn't make us right with God. Love is the result of a changed heart. Love is the result of this evil, centristic, self-centered nature being replaced by the Holy Spirit. Philanthropists may love, but you're not saved by philanthropy. Galatians is a book that brings us back and back and back and back again to think clearly this one question. How is a man right with God? It's the question they ask Jesus so over. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, the will of God is that you believe on him who he has sent. We're not talking about the Christian life as far as these two questions, but we are saying this. If you started in grace, it should result in Christ-likeness. If you start in self, it'll result in hell. It's a stark reality. The theologian in me says, Paul, I wish you'd have painted this picture with a few pastels. A few, a few extra discussions about this because other places this doesn't seem to fit well in what you've said to somebody else. But Paul drew this picture in black and white ink. And what he said is, Galatians, if you choose to be circumcised, I want you to know you've left the one who called you out of darkness. And now you're trying to do it yourself. And if I think I remember one thing from that wonderful passage in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, nobody is going to boast before God. No flesh is going to glory before God. It's just not going to happen. And so if you think you're hot spiritually, I'm here to tell you, you're not. And if you think you can, chances are you can't. But if you'll take the way of humility, recognize who you are, who you were when God found you, who you are even today because of the wickedness of your own heart, and that God loves you because of who He is, 
not because of who you are. And you're saved because of what His Son has done, not because of what you have done or can do. You're going to have joy overflowing. And if you try to mix those things, you're going to be caught up in performance Christianity. And I know of no more miserable people than people who are trying to run to be accepted. Because you can't ever run enough. All the running's been done when Jesus died. And now he says, whosoever will may come. And again, I think the flow, if I could put it all together, is repent, believe, persevere, worship, and serve. And our question today is, which one of those can I leave out and still be all right? See, dead gum us. Our, our whole mindset is, where is the line, Bob, so I can see how close I can get to that and still go to heaven? That's not a biblical question. The question is not what, what can you do or not do to go to heaven. The question is, who do you know? And if you know the, the, the Christ of Calvary, then your life belongs to him, and all that you are and all that you have belongs to him, and he'll use you out of gratitude. Would you bow your head to me, please? The Reformation said this so clearly to us, Lord, because we had gotten away from it. And maybe there needs to be another clear call back to Christ and Christ alone. It's so hard for us to know how to live the Christian life. It is such a struggle. We know what we ought to do, and we catch ourselves in Romans 7 over and over and over, not doing the very thing we ought to do and doing the very thing we hate. But God forgive us for trusting in some past experience that does not impact our life today. And God forgive us for using freedom as a license to live for self. And I don't know what to say, Holy Spirit, except we, we desperately need your wisdom and power to permeate every heart and mind right now. That we would not misunderstand this book of Galatians. And that we might clearly see in what we are trusting. Where is our real hope placed? And only you can do that. I thank you for this book, though it's so difficult to try to understand. It's so scary in its implications. If we know ourselves, Lord, we love you. We want to serve you. We feel like we do the dumbest things sometimes. There's still a spirit of rebellion in us. We can't explain it. It bothers us. It's there. We want assurance. We want confidence. Give us confidence based in a changed and changing life. And give us confidence based in the love of God, the work of the Son, and the wooing of the Spirit. And help us to be able to hear, really hear this text and not smother it with what we want it to say. God, give me wisdom as I study this. This frightens me, Lord. I guess I'm just looking for easy answers to difficult questions. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think tonight I'm going to offer an invitation instead of do questions. Uh, I'd be very happy to talk to you after the service. I don't demand that you agree with me. I think God has allowed me to come to this church to prepare you for a new pastor because the next pastor will not be like Bill Tisdale. And if you know that different isn't automatically bad, and if you're able to read your Bibles for yourself and think, I think whoever comes will have a wonderful deal. But this church is full of so many different kinds of people, so many different emphases, so many different backgrounds. 
the thing that's got to hold us together is the Scriptures and the Lord. So some of you will scare me to death and say, Yeah, I agree with that, always have, didn't like the other deal. Spare me. And those will say, Well, that's the weirdest, wildest, all I say. Pray about it. Go home and read Galatians again from front to back. Think through it. Read some other commentaries. And whatever light you come to, walk in it with joy. Amen? I am a catalyst. That's what I'm meant to do. Now, if you're here, and all your life you've been trusting in the performance of some religion, man, do I have good news for you tonight. It's free, friend. It's already been done. All you've got to do is come to Christ. If you're here tonight and you're, and you're trying to make God accept you by what you do and don't do, I hope you'll hear these warnings. Did you start in faith, be perfected in performance? You can't mix these two. And if you're here tonight, dad gum your hide, and you claim the name of Christ, and you're living a godless, reprobate, sinful life, I hope the Holy Spirit smashes into your heart tonight. And I hope you can see the radical choices this book gives you. I know God wants to speak to you. I'm just not exactly sure exactly what He wants to say to you. But you're not here by accident tonight. We're going to give you a chance to respond. Maybe in light of this you say, I don't know how to respond. I just want to pray. That's a good option. Pray for me. Pray for us. Maybe you want to say, Bob, I have uh, I've really been wandering. This God will forgive and forget and restore and renew. I guess, I guess, beloved people, what I'm trying to say is some of the most ugly, judgmental, angry people I have ever met have been legalistic Christians. Just, it just can't be that way. We need to get free. <laughs> We need to get giddy free. We need to get free in Jesus. Let others be free in Jesus.